Okay, it's uh, Phil Lee, and I'll be making a presentation today, Lee Jackson Day, on the causes of the Civil War. So let me pull up my PowerPoint. It's going to be done remotely. So let me pull up my PowerPoint and we'll get started. Now I want to, enter, I want to enlarge the video of me. Here we go. Here we go. And go back one screen. Here we go. Nearly all current historians claim that Southerners caused the Civil War by illegally seceding from the United States in order to perpetuate black slavery. The original seven state Confederacy started the fighting when it bombarded Fort Sumter. Northerners responded by suppressing the Confederate rebellion, which included four additional states after Sumter, thereby ending slavery and intending to establish a post bellum union providing racial equality for ex-slaves. Almost all of the above synopsis is erroneous or deceptive. First, secession did not cause the war. Northerners could have evacuated Fort Sumter and let the seven cotton states secede and depart in peace but the reasons they didn't are seldom investigated. Upon examination, however, it is revealed that Northerners went to war chiefly to avoid the economic consequences of disunion. Among such consequences would have been the effects of a low tariff Confederacy adjacent to the Federal Union. The overpriced goods of tariff protected Northern manufacturers would have lost their Southern markets to more efficient European producers. Federal tax revenues, predominantly reliant upon customs duties, would have declined by the proportion that Southerners paid. Northerners would have lost their legal monopoly on Southern coastal shipping as the seceded states allowed competitors to enter the market. Finally, the Federal Union would have lost 60% of its exports thereby becoming a perpetual debtor nation to its trading partners. About a month before the opening shots at Fort Sumter, a leading Boston newspaper concluded that the seven cotton states did not secede to protect slavery, but to form a new country that would become an economic rival to the North. Specifically, the Boston transcript editorialized on March 18th 1861, as follows, quote, alleged grievances in regard to slavery were originally the cause for the separation of the cotton states, but the mask has been thrown off and it is apparent that the people of the seceding states are now for commercial independence. The merchants of New Orleans, Charleston and Savannah are possessed with the idea that New York Boston and Philadelphia may be shorn of their mercantile greatness by a revenue system verging on free trade. If the Southern Confederation is allowed to carry out a policy by which only a nominal duty is laid upon imports, no doubt the businesses of the chief Northern cities will be seriously injured. The difference is so great between the tariff of the Union and that of the Confederacy that the entire Northwest, meaning the present day Midwest, must find it to their advantage to purchase import goods at New Orleans rather than New York. In addition, Northern manufacturers will suffer from increased importations resulting from low duties. While the transcripts analysis cannot be taken as the final word, it underscores the importance of evaluating Northern motivations for coercion instead of merely Southern motivations for secession. A second error of the synopsis is that the alleged illegality of secession is only presumed in retrospect. In 1860, there was no consensus on its legal status. In fact, the Northeastern states threatened secession at least five times between the founding of the Republic in 1789 and 1850. The first time was during George Washington's presidency when 
Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton warned that the Northeastern states would secede unless the federal government agreed to assume an obligation to pay off the debts of the, the state debts that were incurred during the Revolutionary War. In 1803, New Englanders threatened to secede over the Louisiana Purchase. They worried that new territories would ultimately become new states, thereby reducing New England's influence in the federal government. Connecticut Sen Senator James Hillhouse warned, quote, the Eastern states must and will dissolve the union and form a separate government if they did not get their way. Other notable New Englanders, such as John Quincy Adams, Elbridge Jerry, Fisher Ames, Josiah Quincy III, Timothy Pickering, Joseph Story, and Joseph Story endorsed his position. In 1807, New England again threatened secession after America announced a trade embargo, hoping to avoid the War of 1812 with economic sanctions. New Englanders objected because their region was then America's maritime center. After the embargo failed, Congress declared war on Great Britain during President James Madison's first administration. But most New Englanders cooperated little in our nation's defense. They traded liberally with the enemy and refused to put their militia into federal service as ordered by President Madison. When the British finally blockaded New England during the last seven months of the 30 month war, the region held a convention in Hartford to discuss secession and other steps to protect their interests from federal powers. In January, 1815, the convention sent emissaries to President Madison to demand five additional constitutional amendments. Upon arriving in Washington, however, they learned that the war had ended and they went home in embarrassment. And soon thereafter, their Federalist Party collapsed. Northeastern leaders again threatened secession over the proposed annexation of Texas. <coughs> in 1843, 12 congressmen, including former President John Quincy Adams, signed a public letter claiming that Texas annexation would not only result in secession of the free states, but would, quote, fully justify it, close quote. A year later, former New York governor and future Secretary of State under Presidents Lincoln and Andrew Johnson, William H. Seward, wrote that, quote, the free labor states cannot yield to Texas annexation. They would consider it grounds for secession, nullification, and disunion, close quote. The Massachusetts legislature underscored that opinion by declaring the 1845 Texas annexation to be unconstitutional. In truth, secession was a remedy that geographically isolated political minorities repeatedly considered from 1789 to 1861. As a result, it tended to find favor with those regions that were out of power in Washington. It was popular in New England when Virginians were president, which included all but four years from 1789 to 1825. Conversely, it was popular in the South when Northerners controlled Washington, or merely the House of Representatives, where the South never had a majority due to the North's greater population, and to the exclusion of two-fifths of the slave population in the South for purposes of calculating House representation. The House was uniquely important because it had the sole power to originate revenue bills. The third deception in the opening synopsis is that the four states that joined the Confederacy after President Lincoln called for troops to coerce the cotton states back into the Union also seceded to protect slavery. In this, uh, in this picture, the, the dark red is the, is, are the seven cotton states, the bright red are the four upper south states that joined afterwards. In truth, the four, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas, 
seceded because they had earlier warned Washington that they considered coercion to be unconstitutional and would fight against it. After joining the cotton states, they provided half of the white population from which the 11 state Confederacy drew nearly all of her soldiers. Fourth, the Southern Confederacy was not a rebellion. It had no purpose to replace the federal government in Washington. Everyone knew Southerners would make no attempt to overthrow Lincoln or militarily invade the Northern states if the cotton states had been allowed to depart peacefully. A fifth pretext is the assumption that Southern secession was an unacceptable alternative to civil war because slavery would otherwise have never ended. Author James Oakes correctly observes in his book, Scorpion's Sting, that slavery would eventually end if it could not spread geographically. Southerners were well aware of Oakes's argument as evidenced by the remarks of a former Mississippi governor to a visiting British journalist four years before the war. Quote, to restrict slavery within certain limits looked a more harmless proposition than to abolishing it outright, but in reality, it was just as fatal. Room for expansion of the institution is an absolute necessity to the South. Historian Oakes, however, erroneously assumes that only the Republican Party's blanket on slavery in the territories ensured that the institution would be isolated in the South. <coughs> in reality, <laughs> excuse me, in reality, a principle involving local option voting termed popular sovereignty convincingly demonstrated two years earlier that it would block the expansion of slavery when Kansas residents voted down a slave state constitution by a margin of 11,000 to 2,000 in 1858. The Southerners could not make a slave state, if Southerners could not make a slave state out of Kansas with popular sovereignty, they would have been unable to do so with any of the federal territories remaining in 1860, which was the year before the Civil War started. West of Texas, the arid lands of present day New Mexico and Arizona, where agriculture could not prosper without irrigation and territories north and west of Kansas were even less hospitable to slave-based agriculture. Nevertheless, 1860 Southerners showed that they would honor the decisions of a popular sovereign of popular sovereignty because their presidential candidate, John C. Breckinridge, included a popular sovereignty plank in his campaign platform. To be sure, Southerner, the Southern version applied to votes that occurred when the pertinent territories applied for statehood. Prior to that, Southerners claimed the right to take slaves into any of the federal territories because such territories were legally common to the entire country, not just a specific section. Without such freedom to immigrate, all future states would be admitted as free states by default. While Southerners could hope that America might acquire new slaveholding lands in the Caribbean or Central America, such expansion could not be accomplished or not likely accomplished without a two thirds treaty vote in the Senate where Southerners became a steadily smaller minority after 1850. If the Republicans had also adopted popular sovereignty, they could have kept slavery quarantined in the South peacefully, but they rejected it because backing away from a total ban would have been politically fatal. Republicans were prepared to endanger the union by deferring to the party's self-preservation instinct, which was ultimately chained to a meaningless point of honor, which is the subtle difference between a total ban on slavery and the pragmatic ban that would result from popular sovereignty. And that is why President-elect Lincoln 
explicitly rejected popular sovereignty in a letter to uh, an Albany Republican leader and refused all compromise. Now, one example was a proposal that would have allowed slavery in present day states of New Mexico and Arizona. But after the Senate rejected the bill with all Republicans voting nay, the sponsor, Kentucky Senator John Crittenden proposed that it be submitted to the country as a national refer referendum. Realizing that voters would likely approve it overwhelmingly, according to newspaperman and Republican Horless Greeley, the Republican controlled Senate never took action on the referendum. Historian Kenneth Stamp concluded, quote, Republicans looked upon compromise as the shortest route to political suicide. It would have necessarily required a repudiation of their slavery ban platform. Thus, it is all too evident that reunion through compromise was impossible without the death of the Republican party. And there were few of its members who chose to make that sacrifice. To Republicans then belonged the responsibility that no compromise was ever offered to the South. Six, the dubious presumption in the synopsis that the Southern secession was a bad alternative to preserving the Union militarily. Let's consider it. Rejecting secession resulted in America's bloodiest war, notwithstanding that the country's 1860 population was only about one fourth of that of 1940, about 700,000 American soldiers died in the Civil War as compared to 400,000 in World War II. Since America's white population in 1860, from which she mainly obtained her soldiers, was only 27 million, the 700,000 Civil War soldier deaths translates to a loss ratio of 2.6%, which would equate to over 8.5 million deaths if applied to America's current population. The loss ratio among white Southerners was 5%, which means that if we had a 5% death ratio loss on today's population on entering a war today, our losses would not be eight and a half million, they would be 17 million. Furthermore, as a wartime president, Lincoln ran roughshod over civil liberties. He arrested Maryland legislators in order to prevent the state's secession, disbanded Missouri's legislature under the glitter of federal bayonets suspended habeas corpus in defiance of a contrary ruling by the, by the Chief Justice, shut down opposition newspapers, imprisoned thousands of citizens on political whim, and manipulated the 1864 soldier vote. The Civil War may not have been worth the cost of the violence done to the Constitution and its irrevocable push toward a progressively more centralized government. Seventh, historians who point to the declaration of causes for secession provided by some of the seven cotton states as proof of the primacy of slavery often overlook other disputes between Northerners and Southerners that are revealed by comparing their respective constitutions. Unlike the federal constitution, the Confederacies did not allow protective tariffs. Southerners were ahead of their time in recognizing the benefits of free trade. They also outlawed public work spending, which instead had to be financed by private industry or the states themselves. Of course, if private industry did it, it's not public work spending, but nonetheless, it's not the central government of the Confederacy. Since Southerners were repelled by crony capitalism, their constitution prohibited subsidies for private industry that had been allowed under the quote, general welfare, close quote, clause of the federal constitution. The Confederate constitution only permitted spending for military defense, repayment of national debt and the operating cost of the central government. No pork barrel spending was allowed. It also included a number of features that underscored a state's rights philosophy. 
constitutional amendments, for example, could only be initiated by a convention of as few as three states, but not Congress. The individual states could also impeach Confederate office holders operating entirely within the borders of such states, but the impeachment trial would take, take place in the Senate of the enrichment. Additionally, historians who cite the Declaration of Causes for Secession to assert the primacy of slavery as a clause as a cause for the Civil War generally fail to note that at least 10 northern free states passed legislative resolutions to explain their objections to secession, while the first seven cotton states were leaving the Union during December of 1860 and January of 1861. Not one, not one of the 10 stated any wish to abolish slavery. The most consistent complaint was opposition to a breakup of the Union, which later became condensed into the noble sounding phrase of, quote, preserving the Union, close quote. Thus, Northerners made mainly went to war in order to avoid the economic consequences of disunion, as explained earlier. Eight, while Northerners were progressively opposed to the expansion of slavery for more than a decade before the Civil War, it should be understood that it was chiefly to reserve the Western lands for whites, not a noble gesture to end slavery. Pennsylvania Congressman David Wilmot made the first attempt to block the expansion of slavery into the territories while leaving it untouched in the slave states. 12 weeks after the Mexican War had started, he attached a restrictive rider to a $2 million funding bill. His rider would require that slavery be prohibited in any territories acquired as a result of the war. Although the soon named Wilmot Proviso is commonly misinterpreted as a moral attack against slavery, it was really motivated by white supremacy. Specifically, Wilmot said, quote, I make no war upon the South, nor upon slavery in the South. I have no squeamish sensitivities upon the subject of slavery, nor morbid sympathy for the slave. I plead the cause of the rights white freemen. I would preserve for free white labor, a fair country, a rich inheritance where the sons of toil of my own race and own color can live without the disgrace which the association with Negro slavery brings upon free labor. Close quote. Although the 1846 proviso passed the House, it failed in the Senate. Nonetheless, it remained a lingering Northern objective for years thereafter. In 1848, Democrats nominated former Michigan Governor Lewis Cass as their presidential candidate. Although Cass had opposed the proviso, he raised popular sovereignty as a democratic way to allow new states to decide by popular vote whether they wanted to join the Union as either free or slave states. Although Cass lost the election, popular sovereignty survived as a principle that might end the seemingly perpetual arguments over the future of slavery. In 1854, Democrat Senator Stephen A. Douglas sponsored the Kansas-Nebraska bill, which would carve the Nebraska Territory out of a part of the Kansas territory and authorize each to decide for themselves whether they shall be slave or free by popular vote at such time as they apply for statehood. Ninth, contrary to popular belief, postbellum Republicans were not indulgent toward their defeated foe. The victor's peace was primarily shaped by their anti bellum priorities, which tended to impoverish the South. One example was the protective tariff. It was a powerful weapon for enabling Northern manufacturers to establish domestic monopolies or near monopolies by blocking imports. But it also encouraged Northern manufacturers, uh, European 
manufacturing economies to buy raw materials from countries other than America because it limited the Europeans' ability to sell us imports that would yield the dollars the Europeans would need to pay for our exports. On the eve of the Civil War, tariffs on dutiable items averaged 19%, but increased to an average of 45% for the next, next 50 years. Consider, for example, railroad iron. In 1861, the 11 state Confederacy had more railroad mileage than any country except the United States. Even though Southern roads badly needed rebuilding after the war, railroad iron sold for $80 a ton in New York as compared to $32 a ton in Liverpool. The differential was largely due to tariffs demanded by Northern iron makers. Even though Midwestern grain states might otherwise have supported free trade, the Republican Party held power by essentially bribing former Midwestern Union soldiers with generous pensions, generous veterans pensions. The pensions, argued the GOP, required high tariffs in order to fund the pensions. The Republican Party generally controlled national politics from the start of the Civil War in 1861 to the bottom of the Great Depression in 1932, over 70 years. Each of the 12 states that had joined the Union during the 35 years from 1861 to 1896 added two Republican senators each. Not until Oklahoma joined 42 years after the war had ended did a new state enter the Union with a single Democrat senator. Republicans transformed the South into an exploited internal colony, much like Great Britain had done with Ireland. Perhaps because of slavery, the region was the world's low-cost producer of cotton before the war. It remained the world's low-cost producer long thereafter because nearly all of her people had been impoverished. Most American cotton was exported well into the 20th century, and even today, it's mostly exported. In 1860, the South's per capita income was at the 72nd percentile of the national average. After the Civil War, it dropped to the 51st percentile and stayed there for at least 35 years. It did not return to its still below average 1860 percentile until 1950. 90 years later. Shortly after the war, Republicans set up puppet Southern regimes by disfranchising ex-Confederates and transforming freedmen into a Republican loyal voting bloc. They made false promises to the freedmen and taught them to hate their former masters. When Republican Ulysses Grant was elected president in 1868, he won only a minority of America's white votes and gained the edge in popular vote only because of the ex-slave vote. Postbellum Republicans launched the gilded age of crony capitalism by giving away 200 million acres of north, uh, land to Northern railroads, which was about twice, twice the property presently within the borders of the state of California. Only negligible land grants went to the former slaves. By 1877, Republicans had abandoned the Blacks because the party could control Congress and the presidency without them. The so-called more perfect union that Lincoln had hoped to form became one in which Black and white Southerners had been dumped into peonage. Even as late as the 1940s, both races worked under conditions little different than Russian serfs of the 19th century. The conqueror's version of black civil rights did not include having blacks live among northerners. In fact, the chief racial goal of northern whites was to keep blacks out of the north. Since freedmen comprised a decisive Republican loyal southern voting bloc until the 1880 presidential election, 
the GOP wanted to keep them there. Simultaneously, Northern workers did not want job-seeking blacks to cross the Ohio River or Mason-Dixon Line. Republican Congressman George Boutwell, who later became Treasury Secretary under President Grant, proposed to reserve the states of South Carolina and Florida exclusively for blacks. Contrary to the misrepresentations of social activist historians, 19th century Jim Crow era Northerners were often at least as racist as Southerners. When French tourist Alexis de Tocqueville visited America in 1830, he observed that race prejudice was most obvious in the states that never had slavery. In 1854, Abraham Lincoln said, quote, the whole nation is interested that the best use shall be made of the federal territories. We want them for the homes of free white people, close quote. Four years later, he added, quote, I am not, nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. And as much as any other man am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. During the Civil War, New York lawyer George Templeton Strong wrote in his famous diary, quote, we Northerners object to slavery on the grounds of political economy, not ethics, close quote. During the Jim Crow era in 1915, when a white boxer beat <clears throat> the aging heavyweight black champion, black heavyweight champion, a crowd of Wall Street bankers watching the, the telegraph results pounded their unknown neighbors, quote, pounded their unknown neighbors on the back and acted like gleeful school children, close quote. One of the prime reasons I wrote causes of the Civil War was to counter the one-sidedness that has induced mob hysteria against Confederate heritage. As noted, historian James Oakes is probably correct when concluding that slavery would have ended if quarantined in the South after 1860. But that could have been accomplished with popular sovereignty, which did not require a complete ban on slaves in the territories that the Republican Party demanded out of its selfish self-preservation instinct. The result was civil war. So I want to thank you for listening to that and also mention to you, let's see here. Here we go. This is a copy of, a, of the book, Causes of the Civil War. If you'd like to buy a copy, you can go to uh, Barnes and Noble or uh, Amazon and buy it. It's uh, $22 at uh, there. If you'd like a signed autographed copy from me, you can contact me, Phil, P-H-I-L, underscore, Lee, L-E-I-G-H, at me, M-E, dot com. And if you live here in the United States, I will autograph it and cover the postage to send it to you. The total price for the book will be $25. So contact me if you want an autographed copy. If you don't want an autographed copy, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, you can get it for $22. Okay, so thanks for watching. That's my speech.